because it's illegal to pass right now until they get that car moved off the track. You know something? You just confirmed something I've always believed. Uh-oh, there's some serious damage there on Marco Greco's car. But as uh, they're, look at the work they're doing. They got the whole back of the gearbox off and going to work on his car. As we came down the main straightaway, I saw a couple of yellow flags, Bobby, from the onboard camera, which just proves that you never see them anyway. Well, that's about right, you know. <laughs> Today, they, they told Jack and Ruth they're going to move the yellow flags back to stations. Well, you're talking about the entire front straightaway now that they can't pass on. But look at Al Unser Jr. now as he's closed up behind third place Scott Goodyear. Well, obviously, both these men know that the minute the yellows come in, their battle is going to resume full tilt. The best Scott Goodyear has ever done in this race is a fifth last year. The best Al Unser Jr. has ever done is first, and he won four in a row. So that gives you some idea of the relative experience here. And Al Unser right now looks like the hunter. Ari Leyendijk, he runs 16th. Buddy Lazier should be just ahead of him. Occasionally, you catch a view of the Lazier car. Remember, we saw Ari's uh, crash just back of where we are here now on the track in practice yesterday. He's shaking that off, but he is not having a great season. Many expected a good deal more of him in this car than he's been able to show so far. Still flags out in the turn off of Seaside. You know, Lion Dyke right there, the Scotch car. That's, there's a team that has Mo Nunn. I think is one of the best engineers in all of IndyCar racing. Came over from England, and he's not been able to figure out the Lola this year. Lion Dyke, of course, is a very good driver, but they have been somewhat like the Dallas team, unable to figure out the new Lola chassis, although it looks like Dallas team has got it figured out today. Yeah, because mechanically, they have the same thing that Nigel Mansell's got. They're just not getting the same speed out of it. And just behind that battle that we just saw, here is that ongoing battle now between Scott Goodyear and Al Unser Jr. in a fight for third place. And you can see that's Emerson it. Fittipaldi, by the way, from time to time ahead. Two minutes and 36 seconds in the pits. They make the change on the car, and now it seems to be running with full boost, though he's about four and a half laps behind the race. Yeah, and that's the unfortunate part of it. Four and a half laps back. It will be fast, but it's kind of like... Like, he's not going to have a defeatist attitude, but only because Roger Penske is the boss and he says race. Now, that my jack car there, that's Robbie Buell, who is sandwiched in between these two battlers for the third position. Buell actually running 17th. So he gets out of the way and lets Allinger Jr. come by. Now, little Al should not be able to close in on Goodyear by the Toyota turn, turn number one here. But by the time they get to Seaside, it seems like they are going to be right on top of one another. Now, it looks like the track right there that turn one, Paul, is back to green again. They've got the car moved. So that means we're going to start seeing some passing at the end of the long straightaway, which is one of the better places to pass on this track. On board with Little Al. There's slower traffic ahead and the chance for Little Al to make a pass as they come to the end of this straightaway and make that right-hand turn. Little Al can't do it. He gets caught behind Ari Leyendijk. He has to move to the inside. He continues his pursuit of Goodyear. There he is, taking Ari on the outside. Remember when you ride with Little Al like this, you're riding with a four-time winner and a man who is thinking not so much that he's getting through these guys, but that he's got to worry about Mansell and Tracy out in front of him running two and one, respectively. The view from the Goodyear blimp over the track here. They scream down toward turn one. They start down through the gears. There are slower cars ahead. And still, Little Al can't get it done. You know, and as we watch, Little Al's in a Chevrolet. The car on the right-hand side, the blue car just ahead of him, that's a Ford-powered car. I think one of the things we're going to be watching all year is Ford against Chevrolet. Chevrolet against Ford. And as we watch the blimp shot from the Goodyear blimp, you can really see that. Look at this. You can really see what happens to the engines, just the engines. Ford power down the straightaway. This view gives you a tremendous opportunity to study the different rates of closures. They both move around Buddy Lazier in the Viper car. And now Allenser Jr. gets back in contact as they come to the hairpin. And they should have a fairly open straightaway ahead of them. If only little Al can gain enough revs as he comes down the straightaway to get on the back end of Scott Goodyear's car. Yes, he needs to get a little bit, a little bit closer to get a good draft. Even though these cars are so streamlined, so aerodynamic, they still need a little help for drafting. Listen to the gears. Over on Seaside, the battle now develops here between Eddie Cheever and Robbie Gordon. It's a battle for ninth place. Al Unser Jr. for the moment broken off in his fight with Scott Goodyear. This is the hottest battle on the circuit. Right behind Gordon, 
Dale Fabi and Scott Pruitt. Just got a glimpse of Paul Tracy in part 12, the leader of the race. We well, watch Robbie Gordon come off of that hairpin turn with a rear end hanging out. That kid is really trying hard. Whatever was ailing his car earlier no longer affects it because he's staying hot in the fight. I Bobby watched. continues to try to attack him. Let's get an update on what may have been Robbie's uh, situation earlier from Gary Gerald. Paul, well, we got a quick word with A.J. Foyt. They had problems with their transmission earlier this weekend. They think they've got difficulty with fifth gear, but they can't confirm it because they've lost radio communication. So double problems. They think it's the transmission that felt Gordon to fall back just a bit. You mentioned earlier that fifth gear was a problem for him during practice earlier in the week. But you know, Gary and Paul, I watched him come off the hairpin turn this morning and the car just stopped, literally stopped on the racetrack. So I just wonder if they don't have some sort of an electronic problem them in the computer system somewhere. Boy, look at that crowd as they come through the hairpin turn and back on the shoreline. Scott Pruitt there in the 45 car. There's Mike, Mark Smith, who is having a great run in the Indy cars this year, though every time you see that 25 car, know that he was in an accident this week. No, not in the Indy car, but in his go-kart and really racked up his left leg. And boy, was he in pain yesterday. He's hoping to be able to make the run without any trouble. On board with second place, Nigel Mansell, as he continues his pursuit of Paul Tracy. Back at the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach as Paul Tracy, the leader, has shredded his left rear tire and is limping for the pits. Nigel Mansell will take over the lead of the race. Jack Aroot's right there. And Paul, this is seven laps earlier than they had hoped to bring the car on pit road. He skids to the stop and look at the condition of the tire. Jerry Breon pulls it off and puts it back on. This is unfortunate because part of the problem was they had fuel mileage problems in Australia. They had solved them, and in talking to Richard Buck, and now they've stalled the car, he said that this was going to work in their favor. They caution early on, and they were stockpiling fuel mileage. That's all gone away now. 19 seconds in and out for Paul Tracy, but he fell well down through the order. Now in sixth place as Nigel Mansell assumes the lead. When he ran into trouble, he had an eight and a half second lead over Mansell, who you see here. Now Tracy has led 57% of the laps this year going into this race. You see what happened to him here. The uh, left rear tire of Paul Tracy shredding suddenly. That's the back straightaway there. He was lucky or very skillful to control the car and bring it into the pits as fast as he did. Well, the whole trick, Sam, is going to be why did it shred? Why did it go bad? Tires don't just blow on their own. So there's a good chance, and that's what we'll have to watch for. They might have bent something while he was blowing or shredding that tire up. So Nigel Mansell now sits in the lead, nearly seven seconds ahead of Alanzer Jr. Seven seconds further back from that is Scott Goodyear, and then Mario Andretti is unchallenged another ten seconds further back from Goodyear. Look at the interval here. We keep track of Mansell and Al Unser Jr., first and second place. And, of course, as they come to the pit stops, that interval will be critical. And also keep in mind, Paul Tracy came in with that blown left rear tire, but it won't make any difference because he was well within the time frame that he would have stopped for fuel normally. So these guys, even though they have a bigger gap on Tracy now, as soon as they pit, it'll all go back to normal again. And his pit stop was only longer because he killed the engine. Word from the Penske team is that Paul Tracy ran over some debris that shredded the tire. Terrible luck. He was so strong here, just as he was at Phoenix. This time, though, debris gets him. As we take a look at Mansell continuing to thread his way through this field. And he is having, as one might expect, some trouble from time to time figuring out the slower traffic that he must move through. In some cases, there are drivers that he is not familiar with. And sometimes he just has to be very, very careful and hope that they move out of the way. Yes, but Mansell has studied IndyCar racing very carefully in the last few months, and he knows a lot about who has done what over the years here, and he must be fully aware that he's got the, the great master of Long Beach currently closing in on him. I mean, little Al has won this thing four times. He knows how to pace himself and his tires through a race like this, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Mansell keys off the man behind him rather than wondering about his own pace. Part of his studies, by the way, for IndyCar racing is Jimmy Vassar. As a problem, they're trying to get him, uh, get him rolling again. He had a little fire, and they brought it in the pits, but now on the pit road, he's got a problem again. 